A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state and the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Join me on the program here in just a a matter of moments. Eric Delbert is going to be with us. He is the uh, owner uh, of uh, LEPD Farms and Range, co-owner there in Columbus, Ohio. Also a a member of law enforcement. We're going to be talking about the uh, shooting of Makia Bryant in Columbus uh, and the protests that have uh, resulted here that seem to ignore reality uh, in favor of a narrative. The, the, the narrative is that, um, well, you got a couple of competing narratives. Uh, the, the, the biggest narrative is that the officer shouldn't have had to, uh, or should not have fired his gun. That, 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 that's the biggest narrative. And then around that basic premise, you've got folks who are downplaying or even outright ignoring the fact that Bryant had a knife and was preparing to stab a teenage girl when she was shot by the officer who responded to a call of an attempted stabbing. They don't want to talk about that. Those facts are inconvenient. Uh, there are a few like surprising uh, folks on the left who, who actually are willing to acknowledge reality. Uh, Chris Cuomo and Don Lemon on CNN, among them. I was shocked to see it. I suspect that they will soon go back to their usual ways. But on Wednesday evening, they actually spoke about this rationally. And said, what, what do you expect? The officer shows up. There's a lethal threat. You've got seconds to respond. Well, I guess a lot of folks on the left don't want to hear what Don Lemon and Chris Cuomo had to say about this because they want a narrative that says, no, the police absolutely did something wrong. They should have aimed for Bryant's leg or they should have used a taser or they should have, you know, tackled her. Uh, in, but they should have done something different. So the outcome here would have been different. And they don't really care about why those things aren't realistic in the situation that we uh, saw unfold just a couple of days ago. So let, let's, 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 let's start this conversation with Eric Delbert from LEPD Farms and Range in Columbus, Ohio, uh, about specifically what life is like, not on Twitter, not in the national media, but what the attitudes and reactions and actions are right now in Columbus itself. Eric, thank you so much, sir, for coming on the program. I really appreciate it. Yeah, great, uh, great to be back with you. I, I wish the uh, the topic were better, but but let me ask you um, right now, just, I mean, describe for me, if you can, the situation uh, in Columbus, Ohio, because I saw, you know, yesterday you've got uh, hundreds of students at the Ohio State University uh, protesting, demanding that uh, the university cut ties with the Columbus Police Department. You've got uh, uh, you know, uh, people who are calling for the abolition of the uh, Columbus Police Department there at uh, protests on uh, Wednesday night. I, I mean, just can you is this just a small fraction of the city, or or is this sort of like where the conventional wisdom in Columbus is at the moment, at least uh, in, in some quarters? It came. I, I have to believe it's a small fraction of the city, and. You know, of course, you wouldn't know that by news accounts uh, every night at the protests. And uh, but it, it, the thing that is most frustrating for us here is, and as you see, and as your your listeners know, it's based on a false narrative. And unfortunately, that false narrative is being perpetuated uh, through some of the media outlets here locally. It's being perpetuated by our our city leaders, who are just really uh, doing a, a a poor job at. Uh, putting statements out that are just not factual and that that's where uh where we're most frustrated i mean they're they're almost complicit in what we're seeing i mean the, the facts just don't seem to matter and and uh we, we are you know we're, we're praying for the officer and his family too and no nobody says that and so it, it's very frustrating i mean we want to do the right thing we want as a uh, fellow officer we want them to be held accountable if something is done outside of policy or against the law but we also need to support them in times such as this. Well, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think most importantly, as you say, we need to look at the facts of this case. And we need to look at the facts of every individual case. You know, you can't just say, uh, as we saw so many media outlets do, 
You know, even as the verdict in the George Floyd case was being announced, Columbus police shot and killed a teenager. Okay, well, that that right. is true, but that leaves out a hell of a lot of pertinent information, including the fact that this teenager had a knife in her hand and was getting ready to stab another teenager. Uh, you know, that that's a critically important point of this story. That's why the officer fired in the first place. Uh, and yet, you know, we're, we're seeing I'm, here's a quote from uh, Hannah Abdul Rahim uh, at a vigil for uh, Makia Bryant on Wednesday night. The system is not broken. There's no cracks in the system. The system was designed for white supremacy. The system was designed perfectly. We need to design a new one. You know, Eric, this was unfortunately a, a white officer who shot a black teenager who was getting ready to stab a black teenager. I mean, those are the racial dynamics of this situation here. I don't know how this points to systemic white supremacy when the officer acted to save the life of a black teenager. But this is the narrative. And as you say, the narrative seems to be way more important to a lot of politicians and certainly a lot of activists than the actual facts on the ground. You're absolutely right. And it's, you know, I'm not one to subscribe to conspiracy theories and so forth, but when you look at the facts and you look at like the Ben Crumps of the world who come out and immediately said, you know, look, another unarmed black person killed by police, which wasn't the case, it makes you wonder if there is some bigger narrative going on because it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. I mean, you look at the prominent sports figures who came out and posted the officer's picture on social media to millions of followers. It just, it doesn't, uh, it just doesn't sit right with us. And it's, it, it's just very, very frustrating. Um, this officer did everything he could. And in the 11 second encounter, uh, he saved the life of, of potentially one person, if not two. And this is what know how society is is envisioning it which is just it's just not right you know one of the other aspects of this um that we we seem to have tunnel vision when we talk about these things um and you know i'm thinking about like uh the the case of adam toledo the uh uh young boy in chicago who was shot and killed uh after running from police officers with a gun in his hand a gun that was given to him by a 21 year old suspect uh who knew that uh, Toledo was likely going to face, you know, far less uh, serious consequences for being caught with an illegal gun than he would be at age 21 in Chicago. We need to talk about all of the moments that led up to these incidents, too. We, we, we tend to focus on one or two frames of body camera footage uh, as opposed to, I think, talking about what's going on in these cities and what even is going on with those individuals uh, who were involved in these incidents. I, I think this is a tragic story. Um, you know, I wish that Makia Bryant was here today. But that doesn't mean that I blame the officer uh, for his actions. I wish that she had stayed inside of her home and not gone out to fight with those girls. I wish that she had not picked up a knife. I wish that she had not done these things. And I, I'll be honest with you, Eric. I mean, I, you know, as we're getting ready for our interview, I was looking at a couple of stories uh, from the Columbus area. This is February 24th. Columbus police uh, arrest teen accused of hitting a woman with a car. Uh, March the 1st, teens blamed for recent carjackings, uh, carjackings, auto thefts in Columbus. It, it seems to me like there is a, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it, it, it seems like there is a, a growing problem with juvenile violent crime in Columbus, Ohio right now. It is off the charts, Cam, and you know, we said in a recent uh, interview, actually on our uh, radio show, that we are, everyone should be outraged at this case. Outraged that society as a whole failed this poor girl. And you can go right down the line to all the, the same day that she was shot and killed, there was a 15-year-old who shot and killed another 15-year-old in Columbus. It is rampant, and we have to take a step back. We're, we all want the same thing. I don't care what community you're from what ethnicity or race or political values you have. We all want to live peacefully. So we should be able to start from there and and grow in, in, on that. And one of the things, we aren't teaching our kids civility. We're not teaching them to respect one another, to respect law and order. I mean, how, how does it become that a 14, 15-year-old are out at gunpoint carjacking? I mean, that there is some underlying issue within society that is allowing that to occur. It's not happening in my neighborhood. So something something within those communities has to change. 
and I'm so disappointed in the leadership here, especially in Columbus, who won't come out and address that. It's always law enforcement problem. We have the president of our city council recently, I think it was even yesterday, came out and said, we need to change the city's training and hiring process in regards to this officer-involved shooting. I mean, that's just nothing to the point that we need to do a better job in raising these children to not commit crimes and violent acts at 14 and 15 years old. You know, and I'm glad that you talk about that because it's interesting. You know, in 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 some scenarios, um, we hear these very same politicians and activists talk about uh, the need to address root causes, right? Uh, and we can't police our way out of these problems. We can't uh, arrest our way out of these problems. Frankly, I agree. We can't uh, ban and arrest our way out of these problems. That's why one of the reasons I'm not in favor of new gun control laws because I think it takes us in the wrong direction and away from effective strategies and tactics that can reduce violent crime and can save lives. But then you've got, you know, these incidents where all of a sudden now, no, we're not going to talk about root causes. We're not going to talk about uh, the failure of uh, families or the failure of the foster care system. Uh, we're going to talk only about uh, officer training. We're going to talk about uh, the, the, the law enforcement response to violent incidents. And we're not going to talk about anything other than that. Again, they, they put their blinders on uh, when, when they feel like it's uh, maybe expedient for them to do so. Uh, and at other times, well, no, 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 now we got to talk about, you know, everything else going on in society. You can't pick it. To me, it's a very dishonest argument. And it cuts against what they say when they say that they want to actually address these problems. No, you don't. It seems to me more and more like you want to make political, hey, you want to get headlines, but you don't actually want to address the problem uh, unless you believe, again, that the problem is simply policing and that if we were to get rid of police, then all these problems would go away. But, you know, just as you mentioned, this 15-year-old who shot and killed another 15-year-old the very same day that uh, uh, Bryant was killed, that story didn't get any headlines. And there were no police involved there. So if we were to abolish the Columbus Police Department tomorrow, it's not like crime would disappear. You would see far more of these types of incidents uh, involving violent criminals. Some of them who I believe are are young enough and are not involved enough that, that we can actually turn their lives around, that they are not beyond hope. But unless we have adequate policing as well as adequate support systems for these individuals, Nothing is going to change for the better. And, and Kim, I don't know, I'll tell you what our biggest fear is, and we are very close to the law enforcement community here in Columbus, being actively involved in it, training here at our store. And my fear is that we are we are beginning to lose good officers. There, there's no there's no reason you would want to get to this profession in this environment. And if that continues to occur, and you've taken policing out. Of uh, you know, out of out of the community, we are in very very big trouble um, down the road, and and I don't unfortunately I don't see any lifeline right now to pull us out of that. I don't see any leaders, especially locally, standing up. It's it's organizations such as ourselves who run a business and you know have a a, a radio show that try to stand out, and it's it's people like us trying to to spread the word. But I tell you. Most days it feels like a losing battle. The the morale is so low with, within uh, these departments, and we can't expect these guys to continue at this level of, of uh, demonization that happens every time, and expect them to continue to, to go out and, and try to do this this very difficult job. Uh, you know, you talk about the morale. Are you seeing officers um, actively look to to leave the department to to maybe you know move to a suburban agency or? Uh... Uh, you know, a, a, a county sheriff's uh, agency, are they getting ready to just, uh, I mean, are, is, is there an exodus on the horizon from the Columbus PD? There is a huge exodus, and there's a huge exodus out of the county um, because the county, I mean, our leadership here is, is really, really not good. Uh, from the mayor down to the city council down to um, down to our, our newly elected prosecutor for the county who ran on a platform that, that he was going to go after officers who succumbed to the temptation to shoot people. That was his platform. He was going to go after these officers who have succumbed to the temptation. And when asked by a reporter, well, sir, aren't they protecting their lives and the lives of others? 
his answer was, they think they are, but they have choices. That, that is who, who is at the top of the, the food chain here in the county. I mean, why would you go out and be an officer in this environment? You know, yeah. it's, it's just, it's just crazy. I, so I've, I've got to imagine that this environment is not only, uh, horrible for officer morale, but uh, it's probably good for your business, Eric. I mean, I imagine that there are a growing number of residents in Columbus who are thinking, all right, I need to be able to protect myself because uh, God knows what's going to be happening with the crime rate. What God knows what's going to happen with the uh, the city going after the police department. It, it, the, the business has been undescribable for, for one year now. And to, to tell you the truth, though, Cam, I would trade it today go back to an environment like we saw at the beginning of last year or 2019, more of a normal business practice. It's, it's not, uh, I mean, it, it, it's just not a healthy environment. I mean, people are very, very scared. We are, our classes, we've had to put on uh, so many more classes on the schedule because people want to get trained, which is a great, great, wonderful thing. I just hate to see it. Uh, because they, they're feeling an imminent threat. They're, they are knowing that law enforcement is not out there being proactive. How how can you be proactive in this environment? It's just it's solely uh, an environment where there you know somebody else is controlling a narrative. And you know, geez, if something were to happen to you on your your shift, look out because public perception locally and nationally is going to immediately be turned against you regardless of facts. The facts just do not matter in these cases. And that, I mean, again, I, I think that is uh, ultimately one of the biggest problems that hopefully we can address as as consumers of news. We can call out the media for its bias and its misinformation. I don't know that it's going to change anything, uh, but we can, you know, at least alert other viewers to the information that they're not getting. I mean, we saw NBC News completely downplay uh, the fact that uh, uh, Bryant had a knife in her hand. They, 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 you know, sort of selectively edited the 911 call uh, that they played on the NBC Nightly News to avoid any mention uh, of the, uh, the, the person who placed that phone call screaming that she was about to get stabbed. Um, not every media outlet has done that, but we need to call these media outlets uh, out when they do try to deceive their audience, because you're right, this is happening more and more frequently. Uh, there is, I, I think, uh, 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 the, the narrative is more important than the news uh, from any news outlets, uh, and this only makes the problem worse. Listen, Eric, I, I appreciate you spending some time with us today, sir, uh, and and thank you for everything you and the uh, folks at LEPD Firearms and Range do. Um, if folks want more information, uh, including about your radio show, how can they find you? Sure. Uh, the website, LEPD.com, it, it has everything on that. The show is on... Um, on podcast. It's every Saturday live on 610 WTVN right here in Columbus, Ohio uh, at noon on Saturdays. And of course, it's on Facebook Live and all the, the social media outlets and so forth. And uh, we love to be a part of the discussion and, and more importantly, a part of the solution. And that's what we're going to continue to do. Well, I appreciate your time today, sir, and I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Great. Thank you so much, Cam. Be safe out there. I right, appreciate Eric Delbert joining us on the program again. I, I, I think this is a tragic situation. But I also don't think that this was a, uh, a criminal act on the part of the police officer. And again, if folks are so interested in reducing violence, well, then you can't just talk about it when it's an officer-involved shooting. You have to talk about the 15-year-old who shot the other 15-year-old. You have to talk about the rise in carjackings among juveniles. You have to talk about what is going on in the city of Columbus and around the country that has led to a stark reversal of a 25-year decline in violent crime across the United States and perhaps the biggest one-year increase in violent crime in at least the last 50 years started in 2020. And this crime spike has continued in many communities into 2021. Now, again, some folks will say, well, it's, it's because uh, more guns were sold. No. I don't think it is. I mean, again, we've had millions of firearms sold each and every year for the past 25 years, and violent crime has gone down. Something else is going on here. And I think that uh, part of it is the not just the war on police, 
waged by a lot of public officials and, and activists. But the the war on policing, the idea that, uh, you know what, if we just got rid of the police, all our problems would be solved. That is such a myopic and naive point of view. But it's also dangerous because, again, it takes us away from strategies and tactics that we can put in place that actually, frankly, not only will reduce violent crime, will reduce the number of arrests. By focusing on the most violent offenders, then you don't arrest people for ticky-tack crimes. But if your position is, well, that doesn't matter because we need to abolish the police, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm sorry, but um, you are going to be creating a situation where uh, violent criminals who already have little fear of the criminal justice system to begin with have absolutely no fear whatsoever. All right, let's get our uh, good deed of the day, our armed citizen story, our recidivist report in as well. In fact, let's start there with our recidivist report. This is out of uh, Augusta, Georgia. Got to get serious, right? Got to got to got to have these gun control laws, got to do got to do more to prevent violent crime by uh, restricting the rights of American citizens. Meanwhile, a man jailed for over a year waiting trial in connection with a family violence incident sentenced to probation on Wednesday after uh, being accused of repeatedly shooting at an ex-girlfriend. Yeah, maybe maybe we need another gun control law. 24-year-old Jermaine Jones pleaded guilty in uh, Richmond County Superior Court to the reduced charge of aggravated assault in exchange for a recommended five-year probation term. Judge Jesse Stone accepted the negotiated sentence and granted Jones' first offender status. The uh, shooting took place October 18, 2019 at the victim's apartment. Not long after, she had called the sheriff's department for assistance in getting Jones to leave her home. The victim reported that she was able to escape injury by fleeing to a bathroom. Uh, Jones, by the way, has a separate family violence charge pending in Richmond County. He is accused of punching and kicking the same woman on October 22, 2019. Despite the repeated charges, again, prosecutors offer Jones a sweetheart plea deal. All you got to do is the time that you've already spent behind bars awaiting trial, sir. You're on your way. Just probation. Just keep your nose out of trouble. I'd like to think that maybe on this separate charge, Jones is going to go to trial, but I doubt it. He's probably going to be given a plea deal. Quite likely it will involve probation. He'll get his slap on the wrist for punching a woman in the face and trying to shoot her. And um, I hope this is not the case, but I, I sadly will not be surprised if we see Mr. Jones' name in uh, news stories somewhere down the road. All right, today's Armed Citizen story. Also, I got to say, a, a sad story. What kind of person, what kind of person tries to rob their grandfather? That's exactly what happened in North Carolina, where a masked man was shot and killed after he broke into his grandfather's home, wearing a mask, so grandpa didn't know that it was his grandson who was trying to rob him as far as he knew as a total stranger. I don't know if it would have made a difference or not. WBTW says uh, 34-year-old Jesse Dwayne Gibson passed away Tuesday evening after being shot multiple times by his grandfather, 76-year-old George Gibson Sr., after Gibson forcibly entered his grandfather's home in Hickory, North Carolina, and tried to steal money. According to the Longview Police Department, Gibson broke into his grandfather's home with his entire face and head concealed with a piece of clothing. Once inside the home, he then physically assaulted his grandfather, attempted to steal cash, pointed a pistol at him. Gibson Sr. acted in self-defense, shooting the intruder. Again, not realizing it was his grandson that had done this. After the break-in and shooting, the younger Gibson ran away from the home, located a short time later at a local hotel. He was taken to a hospital for treatment before he passed away. During the crime scene search, his cell phone was found in his grandfather's driveway. The mask covering was found in a wooded area a short distance from his home. Police investigation revealed that uh, Gibson Sr. needed money to pay his rent. Um, that sucks. That, that, that sucks. It's absolutely no justification for trying to rob your grandfather and assaulting him and pointing a pistol at him. But, uh, yeah, that sucks. 
wonder what would have happened had the younger Gibson called up his grandfather and said, hey, Grandpa, listen, I, 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 I know uh, you don't want to hear this, but I, I'm about to be kicked out of my apartment if I can't pay my rent. I've got nobody else to turn to. Can you help me out? Maybe Grandpa would have said no. And you know what? Grandpa would have been okay to do that. Again, there's no justification for trying to assault your grandfather and rob him, even if it means that you're going out on the street. Yeah, it, that that's a crummy situation to be in. Doing something even worse is not the answer. District attorneys already determined that no charges will be filed against the senior Gibson, that his actions were justified. But again, I, I, I my heart goes out to this grandfather who not only, I'm sure, is wrecked over having to act in self-defense, but knowing again that it was blood, that it was his own grandson who attacked him, who tried to rob him, who pointed a gun at him. That, that, that betrayal combined with the heartache of having to take a life in self-defense. Uh, Again, my 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 heart goes out to the uh, senior Mr. Gibson there in Hickory, North Carolina. Finally, today our uh, good deed of the day from Eureka, Missouri, where a, a police officer. You can see this police officer, by the way, if you look at this burning home on the left side of the uh, image, you'll see a figure outside of that home. That is a police officer running towards the flames. Tim Shipp was honored this week for running into that burning home to save a woman trapped inside. It was back on January 26th. Shipp says that he was working a second job as a security guard at a business when he overheard a call on a police scanner about a uh, house fire just right nearby. So even though he wasn't on duty, he decided to respond to the call because it was only about a quarter mile away. Dispatchers at that point didn't know if there was anybody inside the home. When he arrived, House was fully engulfed in flames. He called out over the loudspeaker from his vehicle asking if anybody was still inside. And a family member told him, yes, there was a woman still inside the home. Firefighters not yet on scene. House is fully engulfed in flames. And Ship said I could hear her calling from the back of the house where I was. And I decided, because I was close, that I needed to act. I couldn't wait around. Neighbor ran over to help, assisted uh, in getting into the home. Ship on his hands and knees, crawled through the smoke, trying to find the uh, 67-year-old. Uh, her son and husband were in the front of the home when the fire started. Her son actually caught on fire, but they were both able to get out of the house. She, on the other hand, had been asleep in the back of the home. Uh, she is disabled. She wears a prosthetic leg. She was unable to get out of the home because the smoke was so thick. She thought, if I can't get out, I hope my family's okay. Well, all of a sudden, she heard Officer Ship's voice. He yelled, raise your hand and I'll find you. She said he grabbed my arm and he drug me all the way out. Family's home, a total loss. But she is thankful, obviously, that she and her family survived. She said if it wasn't for him, he saved my life. Officer Ship, meanwhile, this week said, uh, I do think about it a lot about what could have happened. He said, it does make me feel good that I was able to help out. Well, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Officer Tim Ship in Eureka, Missouri, we thank you for your very good deed. And that is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program as well. I also want to... Uh, Thank all of our VIP subscribers to Bearing Arms. You can become one of them. And I will, I will thank you as well. All you have to do is go to bearingarms.com slash subscribe, and you can sign up for our VIP membership. It gets you access to exclusive uh, content, analysis of some of the day's top stories. Uh, we take apart and fact check the uh, anti-gun opinion pieces, uh, and your support allows us to continue doing the work that we do. Uh, both informing our audience uh, and hopefully uh, strengthening our right to keep and bear arms. So if you go to bearingarms.com slash subscribe and you use the code GUNS, 
You can get 25% off your membership. Again, we certainly thank you for your support. It does mean an awful lot to us. Uh, and um, we're going to continue to keep bringing you the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation. We will not have a Cam and Company on Friday. We will be back on Monday, however. Uh, but BarryAndArms.com, we've got you ca- uh, updated throughout the uh, Friday and throughout the weekend with the latest Second Amendment news and information, uh, including... Uh, the latest, not only the latest bad news, the latest attempts to uh, go after our right to keep our arms, but some of the success stories that we're seeing around the country as well. So make sure to check out the website over the weekend. Don't forget as well, you can subscribe to Town Hall Media on YouTube. That way you'll never miss one of these programs. You can also subscribe to Barry and Arms Cam and Company on Rumble.com, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, the townhall.com podcast page. We want to make sure that there are plenty of places for you to find the show. And again, we do thank you for all of your support. Until we talk again, have a great weekend. Be well, be safe, and be free.